Hi, everybody. Can everybody hear me in the back? Does this work? Um, my name is Riley Hodge. I am a rising senior here at College of the Atlantic. Um, and I would like to extend a warm welcome to our fifth session of the 2023 Summer Institute. Um, yeah. yeah. Now, I could stand here and I could give you a resume of Dr. Courtney Martin and Andy Goldsworthy, but I think you have all of that information in your pamphlets, and I don't think that it's quite within the spirit of the Summer Institute to simply give a resume. And so I'm gonna try something a little bit different and tell you all a little story. For the past three summers, I have been living and working out on Great Duck Island, which is one of College of the Atlantic's research stations, where I spend my time painting and researching herring gulls. And now, these are your classic seagulls, the ubiquitous birds of the New England shoreline. And when, when I first came to COA, I didn't really think much of them. They were the birds that once stole a tuna fish sandwich out of my mom's hands <laughs> on top of Cadillac Mountain. But over the last three years, by living with these birds, by watching them diligently build their nests and lay their eggs, watching their chicks go from these tiny fluff balls to full birds in a matter of weeks, I've fallen head over heels in love with them. And that's a love that came, that, that, that grew from being, from living intimately with these wild lives. And there's something about that that shattered my notion about the world and showed me something that I'd never seen before but that had been there all along. And now, I promise that this isn't just a shameless plug for the misunderstood herring goal. I truly believe that this ties into the conversation that will be had tonight. And that's because one of the things that I've always loved about the work of Andy Goldsworthy is that he's often not creating something out of nothing. He's rearranging the pieces of the natural world to, to to, to highlight something, to show us something that has been there all along. And, and in doing that, he shows us a magic that I think we are often otherwise blinded to. And I think when that happens, when our notions change, when we see something new in a new way, that is when we open the door to change and to growth. And, and there's a quote from a book that I love that I think really speaks to this. Um, and the book is called The Peregrine by a, by a man named J.A. Baker. And in this book he writes, the hardest thing of all to see is what is really there. The hardest thing of all to see is what is really there. And I love this quote not because I love birds and the book is about birds, but I love this book because it's it speaks to that artist within all of us. It speaks to that, that piece of us that yearns to understand the world around us. And I think to do that, to see what is really there, to, to open that door for change and for growth, it takes a tremendous amount of work. And, and that's what, what brings us here tonight, because I think that work is what both Andy Goldsworthy and Dr. Courtney Martin do in their own beautifully unique ways. And so I would like to end my short introduction with a hope. And that hope is that each of us tonight in this conversation is able to see something that we've never seen before, but that has been there all along. And so without further ado, please join me in welcoming Andy Goldsworthy and Dr. Courtney Martin to stage. Thanks, Riley. That's great. That's very nice. Hi. It's exciting to be in Maine. Um, and I have to say that post pandemic, it's super exciting to be anywhere that is this beautiful and wide open. It really is. Um, Andy, I don't know if we have our slides available. Are they here? Okay, all right. Um, 
I wanted to start tonight with uh, a thanks to you for something that, um, you know, we've never really talked about this, but um, we had met in the fall of 2019 when everything felt the same. And by the time that we got to 2020 and everything felt so different, um, there were so many things that had changed, I think, in everybody's lives. The thing that changed most for me was that the city that I feel most connected to, New York, felt so disconnected from everything that, that we'd all known before. And in the fall, when I went to New York on one of my kind of very frenetic day trips from Connecticut, I got to see the red flags. And um, I just wanted to thank you for what, to me, ended up being a day where I finally felt like things were going in the right direction. Um, those flags that we had talked about when we first met in the fall um, seemed hopeful, seemed as if they were reuniting the country in a really positive way, and being done by an outsider seemed even more interesting. Um, it felt like a gift to New York, and so thank you very much for, for doing that for us. Well, it was a great pleasure to do that yeah. project at that particular time. Yeah. Can you, can you talk a little bit about where you are now with this project in Maine? Um, I understand that this is the first time that you will, you will do something here in this state. Um, can you give us a, a sense of where uh, the road line comes from? Uh, well, the road line was um, uh, the result of a lot of the work that I made on the east coast of America. And uh, it has been where I have really worked with granite. And then we have granite in Scotland, but I haven't really engaged with it in the way that I have here in the, in the East Coast. And that's involved working with um, boulders, uh, the Museum of Jewish Heritage, for instance. Boulders came from upstate New York. Storm King Wall is a kind of granity area. It's not quite the same as the boulders, but it, uh, um, and during that process, I would go to a lot of quarries, uh, collecting stones out of the fields, and, and so on and so on. And it was that kind of um, connection that the people here have to granite that began to interest me, mm -hmm. and the journeys that granite made as it left the quarries into the various buildings and places that it went to. And there was one particular quarry where I was working, and I saw these piles of curved stones. And um, they were curb stones. <laughs> and I'm looking at these curves and thinking, and then I, and then I started looking at curb stones everywhere. <laughs> and you know, when people come and see these templates and the stones that they or the templates that I have down there, and it says, no, that you don't have curb stones like that. All of the templates, all of the curb stones that I'm using for this work are based on standard curbs used for the curbing industry. So it's not this kind of design that I've done on paper. It's come from roads. And uh, that led to this. I could go on a lot, but that's led to okay. this, this idea for this particular work here. And how do you start a work like that? Like, do you, do you do research? Do you go to the place first? What's your, can you tell us a bit about process? Well, the research is really the making, you know, the doing and engaging with the materials. Each time I work with something, I learn more about it. And, uh, you know, it is very, very much like Riley said, and that was a wonderful introduction that you know, to, and the, the, really I'm seeing what is there. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and art is this incredible, the means by which things are revealed to me, shown to me, the making of things. There's a huge difference between uh, looking and working with something. Mm -hmm. And that working is important. So that's the research, if you like. That's what it comes out of my hands, out of dealing with, with, with stuff. And inevitably, in that process, I'm meeting people. The, 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 a lot of the stone came from a quarry in, in um, 
uh, in Massachusetts where three brothers work and their father, their grandfather had this quarry and their understanding of the stone and knowledge and love of the stone is, is also what I feed off too. So it's not just a material, it's a life. It's our lives that are bound up in these materials that are very important to it as well. Can I go backwards a bit, just to, for those of us who are here, I think there's probably a range of levels of, of knowledge about your past work, about you know, where you come from. So um, you are from Leeds, uh, which is sort of middle north in England. Um, you attended Bradford's College of Art initially, and then you went to what was then the Preston Polytechnic, which is now Central Lancashire at Preston, I think. Um, at what point do you recognize that you are an artist? Well, that's all I've ever been able to do. <laughs> I mean, re not really. I mean, fortunately, I've never had any choice. In, you know, then I, that's all, all, all I've done is, is art. And, uh, and that's kind of a little doubled edge going through education, or it was when I went through education, because... Uh, um, we had streaming at the, uh, the, when you were 11 years old from uh, primary school, then you streamed into the high school or the secondary modern. The, more, the brighter kids went to the, the high school, the grammar schools, and the others went to the more, the, the secondary modern. And uh, because I did art, I think I was assumed to be a little stupid. <laughs> and, but I was bright enough to act, to know that if I acted stupid, I'd be able to make more art. So I was just, <laughs> I was just able to make, uh, you know, they just let me paint away. You know? <laughs> and and I, I don't think, I really, I don't think they even sat the exam. They just all immediately put me into the secondary modern uh, school. So that was that kind of trajectory. But I think the uh, the I think the the moment one of those one of those really kind of significant moments, apart from always making and drawing and painting and doing things. Mm -hmm. So I worked. I began working on farms when I was 13, 14, and that was an incredibly important formative experience, engaging with materials and stuff, and working in a farming context, which can be really raw, tough, difficult. You know, it's not mm -hmm. this pastoral idyll that uh, or people like to think it is. And, and the farm was on the edge of Leeds, the city. So it's where Leeds stops very abruptly. So on one side is the city, on the other side was a farm. And this, inc this, this uh, kind of juxtaposition between the two was really important. But uh, one, one of the jobs I had was uh, we used to collect stones from the fields. And you, know, you were walking along throwing stones into the back of a trailer. And then we came to undo, unload the trailer, and my brother was on the trailer passing the stones to me. I was put them in a pile. And this pile took on a, it wasn't just a pile, you know? Well, it was just a pile, but it was a lot more than a pile. And it was, and the last stone to came up, come off the trailer was the last stone on the top. And the farmer came along, he said, you should put a flag on that, <laughs> you know? So it really took on a, I think that was probably my first sculptural uh, experience. And then they're making haystacks, you know, they, these, mm -hmm. these big minimalist sort of blocks in the field and the way they construct and put together. These are such important experiences. Wow. Okay, you've opened the door, and now, <laughs> and now we get to go through it because you said minimalist. So do you define yourself as a minimalist? I guess I don't really define myself as much, uh, you know, <laughs> many things, but I do, I, I'm always striving after the most, uh, the, 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 the simplest, of course, yes. And, and, and there's a whole, the process, the reductive process is very, very important. And this line I'm making here is, is I'm trying to find this line that travels through the, 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 the campus and, and finding that route and the simplest route, but one that speaks most about the place that it travels through. So, I mean, I could do florid things with these stones, believe you me. I could have it <laughs> doing all sorts of baroque shapes on the landscape, and that's not the point. You know, it's not about to show how clever I am. It's about trying to produce a line that speaks about that place. Mm. And how do you know 
How, because it, it feels like what you're describing is um, that you're willing to pull back from doing the thing, that you could go that extra step or you could go in that direction and make it something else. How do you know when it's enough? It's very, very difficult to know that, and whether you've made the right decision. And ultimately, I'll only know when I come back in a year or two's time. You know, that will be the moment. But, you know, where I, where I am at the moment of the work, this point of the, the work, I'm at the bottom of the, the, the hill, as you probably know, nearby the water, near the dock, and I'm about to go up the hill. And my, I initially was going to go, if you're looking towards the road, I was going to go up the right-hand side and uh, where they, there was kind of the remains of what was going to be an amphitheater area. There's some bit of earthworks there. And I thought I could perhaps work in there some sort of seating that people could sit on, not because I'm pandering to whatever you, you know, making people seats for people, <laughs> but people are very much part of this work and the idea of them sitting on it, engage with them, being in this social area, and it appeals to me. Cause it's and so, I, but that's where some really special trees are too. And I, I'm going to go through the trees, getting through. The tree. I know I can get through the trees, okay. But there's a tension there. And there's a lot of people that feel very uncomfortable about that too here. So I'm, I'm kind of like thinking, well, others are an alternative. And then I move to the left, which is a much simpler quieter route. And it's not that I'm kind of, again, making the work to order or the line to order, but the social nature of any sculpture is really kind of important. And uh, there's a tension in lines and boundaries and that is, has to be taken into account. And that can give a certain energy to the work. So it's become a lot quieter. I had this... <laughs> going up that side, and now it's more of a and just going mm. up the top. And I, so that's where I am at the moment. And whether I go that way or this way, I won't know until tomorrow, but I think I'm going on the left, <laughs> you know. <laughs> it's, 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 it's hugely... It's hugely... It's, it's, so, so in, it's intense. Mm -hmm. And anybody who's seen me, I'm walking up and down, up and down, up and down, changing, walking up and down. And I am putting so much effort, and this physical effort, into the work to achieve something that appears effortless. Mm. You know, I... And as people come along and say, oh, you're going to make this thing on the path that's going to trip people up and it'll get with it. It's like... And then one guy came today and he said, oh, I can see you're going to get level with the path there. And he's an old storm guy. Who, Is he here? I don't know. Are you here? <laughs> <laughs> he did a lot of work on the, 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 the gardens here mm -hmm. and he was a student here. He remembers a lot about the college. And he knows what I'm doing. That When I aim for the path, I have to start way back before I get there. And I have to get the line to get level with the path so I can cross the path level with it and not create a tripping hazard. <laughs> so for all of you who've been getting really worked up, <laughs> I'm on the case. <laughs> but it, uh, you know, those are the kind of things that, you know, and I think so, it's so the, 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 the challenge of achieving that, and then the responsibility of making a work like this. Mm -hmm. you know, it's a really big responsibility. To whom? To me, personal responsibility that I should, I've been, I am going to make a work in this place. And, and it's, uh, you know, as people will, you know, this is the first time a lot of people here will have seen me actually making a project. Mm -hmm. And it, you know, people come on and say, that's not like the dandelions, is it? You know. <laughs> 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 and there's a shock that Andy Goldsworthy is with a digger and machines and we're digging the ground and we're <laughs> digging this all up. And the same people, had they come, they come back after, when the work's finished and not seen all that, would not, s not even think about it. Mm -hmm. It all heals over and it, all the effort goes. But that, that effort has always been part of, from 1984, when I, in the early days, that was the first big project I made in Grisdale Forest in Cumbria, 
that involved all of these kind of things. But there is a perception upon a lot of people who'd like me to be the leaf feather <laughs> guy, and, and this is a little shock for them when I do that. But for me, it makes total sense. Do you... You show us a lot, and part of, part of what you show us is, is almost inevitable. So there is no way that unless we close down the entirety of the island that we would be able to not see what you're doing right now. <laughs> Do you ever worry that that kind of reveal takes away the magic? Just what you've described, this thing that you come back after it's done and you don't see any of that. You don't see the labor. In some ways, yes, uh, but on the, other, on the other hand, um, there is a tension and challenge and uh, the resistance of the place that is part of the work. You know, every, most of the places I work in are places where there are people. Mm. There isn't, again, a perception that I just uh, work in some wilderness, but they're very, there's a strong social nature in the places that I work and the strong social nature to the work that I do. And it's important that uh, I don't, I very rarely work on my own land. So okay. I work on other people. So I, I, any time a farmer can come across me and see what I'm doing and ask what I'm doing or drive over what I'm doing, you know. <laughs> And they have the right to do that. And that, I think, is important. That, I think, is one of the fundamental differences between uh, a lot of the American land art and things that have been done in Britain. Because we don't typically, by a big tract of desert, own it, protect it, and control it. Anywhere in Britain, you don't have that control. Mm -hmm. You never have that control over it. And that can make it incredibly difficult, but also far more rewarding, I feel. So all these difficulties and challenges a part of the work, and I think ultimately it helps me. It's like doing this tonight. I don't like doing this, but it's really good for me to do that. It's yeah. important. I have to show off just a little bit because my parents paid a lot of money for my education. <laughs> so, um, Henry Moore and Barbara Hepworth are roughly from the same place that you're from. Hepworth dies in 75, Moore in 86. So by the time that you've already figured out that you're going to be an artist, their sort of um, pivotal place, I think, in British art, but also the internationalization of British art is clear to everyone. So they are not just, um, you know, they're not just stars at home, in a sense. Um, after 46, everybody in the world knows who Henry Moore is. And, you know, after the United Nations sculpture, most people will know who Barbara Hepworth is, and will know that there's a relationship between those two people. As a person, just age-wise, you were also roughly contemporary with many of, many of the New York minimalist artists, these artists that you're referring to now and saying, you know, this is the difference between me and the ones who are working in America. And then there are the British artists who are coming largely out of schools in London who are doing kind of conceptual sculpture, people like Richard Long, for example. Do you feel any kind of relationship with any of these camps? It was, uh, I think the, so I was started in 70, 74, 75, working outside, 76, I think the, is that right, Tina, 76, the first works were made out, outside. Um, and uh, I think it was the, well, I know that it was the American la land artists that were, were the ones that really opened things up for me. Okay. Um, Smithson. Smithson, Heiser, uh, Christo, who is an incredible artist, um, Dennis Oppenheim. Mm -hmm. And there was, there was this sort of, and at that time it was less so Richard, in fact not so Richard Long because they, they weren't as known mm -hmm. then. And Richard Long came to, the first time I saw Richard Long's work is when they brought him to my uh, college because he saw, I'd started working outside. So I saw him, he presented, a pre did a presentation at our college. That was the first time I saw wow. Richard Long's work, which was amazing to see that. Um, but the uh, the 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 American art land artists, I think, were were, were more more significant. And there's a sort of a um, there is a 
there was a sort of a cliched approach to it in the, the American, and I almost said the same thing then about the, the desert. I didn't, mm -hmm. it's not quite as simple as that. The, 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 the Americans make large, huge, big sculptures, and the British go around doing smaller, more delicate things, you know. It's mostly true, though. It's mostly true, but it's not entirely true. <laughs> not entirely true. You know, I make big things, talking yeah. wall. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Dennis Oppenheim, the, 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 the third degree burn, whatever mm -hmm. the shadow on his, his uh, with a book, he put a book yeah. on his chest and left the shadow, and I make rain shadows and shadows. You know, that's, these kind of things are very important. But it's a whole range of things that I kind of um, picked up. And, and, and Christo, his, uh, the running fence. And the danger is that you, you know, the, the, in the art world, I once did a talk with Molly Donovan from the, the National mm -hmm. Gallery. And I mentioned that I have this kind of strange relation with Magritte, whose painting I really don't particularly respond to. It's very cold, it's very... But the ideas in there are so close, mm -hmm. often. To, you know, when, you, when he paints uh, the landscape in a wall, that's the clay walls, you know. And, and I look at his work sometimes, how does he know that? You know, how does he know that when he paints like that? How can he not know that without feeling it? Because I have to... F anyway, that's a... Probably a whole, whole other, um, um, other, other, other subject. I've gone off track now. It's okay. It's okay. We were talking about you know sort of where you think you sit where relative to the different kinds of, of. I don't want to say I don't want to use the word influence because I think that's yeah. A, no, I was talking actually about uh, 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 crystal. Yeah. The running fence. What a fantastic wall work. And I've made a wall, you know, I've made the walking wall. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, uh, but to say that I, it was, it, it, it's been affected by Christo, but I live in a country with walls that walk all over the landscape. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, ter the title Walking Wall comes from a Norman Nicholson poem, The Wall That Went For, you know, went for a Walk. And that's in, um, uh, he was a Cumbrian poet. Mm -hmm. And he talks about the way walls move and travel through the landscape. So it's a complex, in fabulously complex and interesting kind of dialogue between artists, poetry, and the land that yeah. produces these things. Just a few minutes ago, I saw uh, the images from Storm King flash by. And I spent a lot of time in Storm King in 2020 because you know there was very few other places you could go to see art. And so I got to spend more time than I ever had with your piece there, which is your first kind of big foray into America. Um, I think it's your largest work to date anywhere. Is it, is it the kind of thing that you wake up thinking about? That large scale outdoor work? Because I would come home after going to Storm King and immediately look at images of your, your pictures that you're taking that I think are also objects and then the films that you make, which are incredible. How do, how do all of those media sit together? Well, the, the, uh, the ephemeral work, the things that I make, they're done intuitively. And I go out in the morning, I don't know what I'm going to make generally. Not always, but generally. And they're food. That's what feeds me. That's what give, you know, I take. That's, I take and that fills me with ideas and, and, and it's food. That's the nourishment. Mm. Things like this take. Mm -hmm. the making a work like this is taking. It's a totally different experience. And that's a really good thing because you need something that gives and you need something that takes. That's the way the mind and the body works. So you give and take. And you can, it's a bit like having a creative bank account. You can sort of save and save and save and never spend it, but you know what's the point of that? So I kind of gather this stuff up and then it, has, it comes out in ways, ways like that. And I find that dialogue between the two has been very, very important to me as, a, as an artist. But uh, without the ephemeral work, I wouldn't, be, I wouldn't be able to sustain the ideas. I need that to be able to do this and there are there are times there was one day during the last when i was here last and it was a tough start it was a tough start to the project last time mm -hmm. there was uh difficult trying to figure out the site how to make the work and i've never made this work before so i have i know i can i've got a lot of experience 
And I've reached that age in my life where I can go into something no, not knowing what I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. uh, but I do have to figure it out. And the first day I'm here, I'm standing on the site with this going on. This girl walks, walks down, she says, you know, you've taken away a child, kid's play area. <laughs> it's like, ugh. <laughs> And as she walks out, I'm saying, well, actually, I think I've given a, a, an area for kids to play on. But she said, no, you haven't. And then walk, <laughs> walked off, you know, in a, in, in a way that only the young can be so certain, you know. <laughs> and uh, it is actually the most playful sculpture I have ever made, I have to say. <laughs> and uh, the notion that this will be walked by students and it's very important to the work and uh, and the way they engage with it you know so I've never made a work more appropriate for play anyway so there's that and then there's a whole there is a faction that are very you know not supportive of the work there's a lot of people who are supportive of the work but there's this tension you know and after a week of trying to figure out the sculpture and all this going on I had sun the Sunday off and I went to the beach, not knowing what I was going to do. And there was this amazing seaweed all over the rocks. And uh, Wait, you started making work on your day off? Oh, God, yes. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah of course. And uh, um, uh, I did a film work. I set up the camera, and, and I'd, find, I'd look at the rocks and, and see the seaweed. And I thought, I wonder if I could disappear into that. And... Sure enough, I kind of into the seaweed and totally covered myself in the seaweed. And being inside the seaweed and the coolness and this kind of wonderful lattice work of seaweed over my eyes and the noise of all the, the sounds that are in there, all this cr crackling and moving. And so I just lay there for 20, 20 minutes into the, and I did about four or five of these works because. Uh, it was really difficult to get one where I'd completely covered myself because I can't see if I've covered. So I'd have my leg out. It's like, oh, bro. so I had to do another <laughs> one. And, and I did one where I, my hand only appears for a minute, but I more or less disappear completely into the seaweed. And that's when, that's when the camera is a very Im interesting part of the process because it's a tool to see what I'm doing to work with it. And, to, and the last one that I did, I, I got the seaweed, uh, I got this place laid down, and it was, the tide came in. <laughs> I timed it, right. So the tide comes in as I'm lying in the seaweed. And unfortunately, the battery ran out on that one. So I... <laughs> but what a great day. And I came back really a lot, you know, I much better fettle than I had, you know, before I'd started. And that's the difference, you know? Yeah. That is the difference. Darren is terrified right now to ever let you have a day off that we like, go out to sea. <laughs> Yeah. Do you, you know, I listened to you talk about the work. We had this conversation earlier, and I've, I've wondered for a long time, are you a naturalist? Do you have an interest in the environment that is outside the work? I, I do, but it's nothing as insightful as what I get within the work. Mm -hmm. and, and when you work with, work with something, it just... You know, I did a series of works over the last two or three years. It was in lockdown, began in lockdown, where I just, uh, I just see how, man, how many branches or whatever or grass I can fit in my hand. And I, my hand just disappears into these fistfuls of materials. And I did them with... Uh, I think the first ones with, were with, uh, they were in the summer, with summer leaves. I'd get some twigs with the leaves on. I did oak, I did ash, I did all the trees. And then as uh, winter came, I did all the, the, the branched twigs, mm -hmm. different twigs. And then when spring came, I did um, spring. Uh, when, a, when a tree comes into, into, into leaf. And I learned. Every tree and you know, and I knew the differences and the um, and that all trees don't produce the same kind of bud and 
and the knowledge I got from that was huge mm. because I was making the work. And in fact, I just did three more um, uh, with barley, oats, and wheat mm -hmm. in fields. You know, and this is at a time when fields are being bombed, and mm -hmm. it's just like this, and you know, yeah, it's full. It came, I, I saw this, and it came out during one of the weeks where everyone was talking about the embargo mm -hmm. of wheat yeah, yeah. to the Ukraine. Yeah. And I thought, that feels really political. Is that ever? Oh, it, it certainly informs. I mean, it's not, okay. I wouldn't start with a, right, well, now today I'm going to make a political work, you know, but it's in you. It's just, mm -hmm. it's just in that. And when you see a wheat field and you know what's happening elsewhere in the world over a wheat field and the food and what that represents, and the fist is a very powerful gesture. Mm -hmm. gesture of support. I feel, as someone who studies British art, um, that your decision to live in Scotland is, um, that feels political at times to me. It feels very, very specific. Um, I don't know necessarily that, that most of our audience would understand the differences between the environment. Is there a dis difference for you between living in England versus living in Scotland? In terms of the environment, the mm -hmm. actual food? Well, the landscape is, is uh, British landscape changes so much from region to region. Um, so is Scotland better for your work? I moved to Scotland because I was really poor. I was living in Cumbria on the other side of the border and it was a little more expensive. And um, the right to roam. You can walk anywhere in Scotland. Um, that's a, that was a big deal for me, you know, <laughs> to be able to go places. And um, that was a great move to do. I love Scotland. And there was a, the, I live in a small village. And uh, I'm an artist and I'm English. <laughs> so, <laughs> and the, um, I have been, I've been supported, tolerated my whole, f my family, my children have been brought up there. It's been a great place to live. And that, I think the, the more interesting, you know, question is really why I stayed there. Mm -hmm. And that, the landscape is beautiful, but I can work in any place. You know, I feel I can work anywhere. The really reason I stay there is because of the people. Mm -hmm. Is there anywhere that you haven't gone to make work that you would like to? Oh, there's a lot of places around my home I haven't quite sorted out yet. Okay. You know, I really, I've got so much around where I live in Scotland I'd like to go to. Um, in terms of the world, generally, I only go where I'm asked. And I like that. I like mm -hmm. going to places be, by, by invitation because I get to come here. <laughs> and all of those places that I've been to and and meet people who are of the place and, and get a, it's a real privilege to have that insight into a place that I work. Same as with the, you know, understanding the leaves. The, once I'm working in a place, it's a different level of engagement mm -hmm. than if I was coming here as a visitor. Andy, do you write? Do I write? Mm -hmm. Very slowly. <laughs> Oh, it's desperately slow. Um, I, I write when I have something I need to sort out or say. Often the proposals for works, mm -hmm. I, they, they, they take a quite, quite a bit of doing. And uh, yeah, so that's probably the only time I write. I don't think I write about subjects other than that. Okay. I think. I've come trying to think if I've ever written anything on anything other than me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <No. laughs> I Tina knows that's my partner. <laughs> no, that's exactly exactly true. Maybe you should give me subject matter. I could give you an essay every week. <laughs> so sweet, you're right on the impressionists. <laughs> I would love to hear. I'd love to hear your thoughts on Manet more than anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah well, I, uh, yeah, maybe. I had one of the ideas I... Um, oh, that's another thing. No, we'll go to that. Go on. You sure? 
Well, I was just saying, you know, and responding to, to uh, when, when we were once talking about doing a, an exhibition at Yale, and that got uh, that didn't happen because of COVID. It's uh, me. I, it, it was me. <laughs> and uh, the um, one of the really nice ideas I think I got was for the to arrange the collection by time of the day. Oh. And I was going, we were going to arrange yeah. it by the time of the day in one of the long galleries. I remember this. And yeah. I thought that was such a really beautiful way of looking at the collection because the works made at dawn, night, and we'd have yeah. to, and it was going to be this research thing where someone would have to figure out, maybe we could find out whether the shadows were at a particular time. To yeah. It was just been this wonderful way of engaging with uh, with the collection and, art, and artists and time and have this room of the times of the day. Oh, I'm so glad to remember it. That is was an incredible idea. Mm. Yeah. So it would have been an Andy Goldsworthy, but it would have been an <laughs> exhibition at the same time. We're not, we're not done yet, Andy. We're not done. Yeah, yeah. What we are, I think, done with, though, is just me talking to you. I think I can feel there's an energy here that people want to ask you questions. Um, do we have questions in the audience? We've got one back here. May, sir, may I ask you to wait until you have a mic so that we can hear you? And the live stream audience can hear you as well. Uh, thank you. Uh, it's been wonderful so far. I uh, have, a, have a question, Andy. Uh, I've had the privilege of uh, wandering the Cumbrian countryside looking at your work. I was wondering, could you talk a little bit about the project now that you're undertaking in Yorkshire, uh, 25, nearly 30 years later, uh, and just uh, perhaps talk about the arc of your work and uh, that I, I would listen. To, I'd love to hear that. Thank you. So the project in Yorkshire. So I've got a few in there, but I'm hoping you're referring to the one that I've been working on for the last 12 years, called Hanging Stones. Yes, the, the, the buildings. The buildings. Yeah. 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 Can you describe it for the audience, <sighs> just briefly? Well, in my life. I've had three projects. The first was in Sheepfold Project in the 90s, where it was a, called 100 Sheepfolds. I was going to rebuild 100 sheep enclosures as artworks. Um, I was attracted to the folds because these are identifiable places where people have worked and that people have the presence of people. And that in exchange for rebuilding the fold, they would let me make it into an artwork. That project ground to a halt with probably 50 folds being made in the end. And for a long time, I've worked in the south of France in a, s a small town called dean le -Ban. And this t town uh, invited me years back, and I made sculptures, which eventually led to this idea of a nine-day walk over the mountains where I rebuilt uh, farm buildings, houses, as artworks for people to sleep in. Mm. And... Uh, that ran out of money, and I haven't done any of that for 10 years. I went there recently last week because the director, oh, a few, two or three weeks ago, because the director has retired. And it was amazing that even with the small five or six, seven houses that I've done, mm -hmm. it, now there are guides employed to take people around it. And it, it is a very complicated project in many, but very beautiful and simple in, in others. And I may we may try and finish a few of that. However, in 2000-something, I was asked by uh, David Ross, who has a big an estate in North Yorkshire, 10 miles from where my parents lived, lived at the time, or my mother lived at the time, and um, I made a, two works for him, which were two houses, uh, one a re rebuilt house and one a, a new building that had two artworks in and after making those, he asked, did I want to make anything else there? And I got to know this one valley, and I came up with the Hanging Stones project, which is 10 houses, a barn, a, a, a farmhouse, whatever, and I rebuild them as artworks, and it's, a, it's, a six, it's about six, seven, or eight-hour walk. It's you can done in a single day, and I've got one more house to do, and it will be finished. And it is such... Um, 
it really is that I finally finished one of these major pieces, which isn't an object in the land, but a layer laid on it that is so engaged with that place that is so part of it. In fact, when you open the door to the house, you're not opening the door just to the building, you're opening a door to the landscape. You mm. enter the landscape and go inside it. And it's an acknowledgement that people are bound up with the land and we are part of nature. Mm. We are nature, we are in, we are the same. So that for me is probably the most important thing I will ever make. And it's, uh, the, it's open, uh, people can get a, mm -hmm. the key, you, you and, and I limit it to uh, four groups a day, no more than six in a group, unless you get prior, whatever, whatever. And uh, and and uh, it's uh, I, I think it's um, it's in the place where I grew up, yeah. which f for me as an artist is perfect. And I, it came at the age from 57 to 67, which I am now, which are really precious, precious years. I'm still fit, strong enough to make the work, and I have all that experience. Thank goodness that project came at that time. I mean, really, I'm so grateful for the Ross Foundation for, 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 for allowing me to do that and funding that. Wow. We've got a question in the back. So you've already answered one of my questions, so now I just have a comment. And I'm guessing that what I'm gonna say is true for many, many people. When I see art, sometimes I'm compelled to make my own art because I've been inspired by it. But when I see your art, which I've been looking at through your books for decades now, it, it transforms what I perceive in nature, what I want to do in nature, and I'm guessing there are millions of us who go out into the natural world differently now, and we create in nature now, and it's because of you. So I just want to say thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That was never my intention. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, you know, it's, it's, it's a very private, personal thing that I do out there, but it's had this... I mean, I think if I went and thought, right, I'm going to make something that's going to tell people this or do something, or, I think it wouldn't have that same impact. Mm. I've got a question all the way in the back, standing. Someone, okay, sorry, I'll come to you next. Someone has the mic up front, may I ask you please? Yes, uh, we were staying in the Lake District in a bed and breakfast, and down at breakfast one morning we looked out at this absolutely beautiful stone structure, and we asked the bed and breakfast owner what it was, and she said, oh, there was this crazy artist who came down, <laughs> and he wanted to build these sheep folds, she said the good part was that he employed a lot of stonemasons who were going out of business. The bad part is no self-respecting sheep would ever be seen in it. <laughs> <laughs> so we decided to hike over, and, or just walk over and look at it. And as we got close, the sheep started to pour out, almost <laughs> knocking us See? down. And I'm only sorry that you only got 54 of them done because they were great structures and I'm sure there are lots of happy sheep. Well, I think the key part of that was Cumbrian farmers. The bed and breakfast was probably a farm. You know, the Cumbrians were really difficult. <laughs> it, was, it was tough. You know, it was really tough. And um, eventually, I guess, I got worn down by it or it just... Ran out the and 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 the needs that um, yeah I don't have a compulsion to make another sheepfold I have to say <laughs> um, I do have an urge to do the houses in France so that's funny that's interesting I have to think about that is there just as a as a kind of follow up to that though I wonder you know you do employ skills that are not as used in building 
now and in, in architecture at all. Are you training people? Are you training a generation of people to have a skill set that might be lost otherwise? God, I wish I could and I'd use them to work on my art. You know, I mean, <laughs> it's, I think the biggest problem is getting people to work. I work we work really hard mm -hmm. and we have to put, put in long days. It's that kind of, I have a crew, three or four guys, two of which worked on the Storm King Wall with me, father and son, and they've worked with me for 20-odd years, mm -hmm. uh, 20, over 20 years. And it's a huge honor to work with them. And we have learned so much together. And I know that I give them the confidence to make things that they would never dare do. Mm -hmm. And they also allow me, they give me the language to which I can express those ideas or, or, or uh, carry out those ideas. I'll never forget when we were doing the... Uh, the slate domes at the National Gallery, and the first one fell in. And they were all going, this is impossible. And I said, no, it's not impossible. Just trust me. You know, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll get there. And that's how, 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 how we are. It's been a huge privilege. Um, and I think that the, the idea that these skills are being lost, I think there's more people making stonework and doing walls than ever before. But whether they're doing them... You know, my stonework is rooted in agriculture. And agricultural walls are connected to farmers. Mm -hmm. And farmers don't want to pay a lot. <laughs> and a dry stone waller would get paid pie per yard mm -hmm. originally. And they would do three yards a day. And they had to work fast to make a good living. Speed is very important to that. You know, so, you know, ever, people often think speed is a compromise to an artist or whatever. For me, it's not. It's the way I get on. You know, but it's, it's, this, this, is, it's this balance between speed and beauty or whatever. Mm -hmm. And, 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 and the, the, we can all do perfection. Perfection's pretty easy if you can you spend your whole life doing one, one thing. But if, you know, if you want to make more than, mm -hmm. you know, so you can get hooked up on perfection. So, and in fact, what's interesting is that we know the line where it, it um, where the compromise is. You still, and in fact, the sculpture is often so much better with that energy and a little rawness. And if it were perfection, it would lose mm -hmm. that. But that that, is, that aside, um, I don't know what I'm saying now. I think we've got a question in the back. Yeah. yeah. Could you talk a little bit about the pictures? How much of a part of the art are they? How spontaneous can they be? How do you take them? Is someone with you all the time? No, it's just me. And, <laughs> and uh, like I said, I, um, I set my camera up on a tripod, and it's there, and, 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 and I do that. But the f photography is, is uh, I can spend more time on the photograph, taking photographs in the work sometimes, making the work. And it's not made for the photograph to graph in the, the simple sense, but the photography is a way of looking at it, working with it, understanding it, seeing the light. It's a, it's a continuation of my, my way of working uh, with it. And uh, the photographer, as Brancusi said about his sculpture, why, photo, why talk about sculpture when I can photograph it? There is a language to photography, and it's been as an important as making the workers understanding what, I, what I've done when I, 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 I see the time and change. And I don't think I would have that same awareness, acute awareness, if I wasn't taking photographs. If I was just sitting there watching it, it wouldn't be the same. Mm -hmm. The photography is a tool, just as my hands. Are you interested in photography in general? Like no. other, other photography? I, 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 I like that. I mean, photography as being... Um, a, a, a moment in time the, when it was just about that, the power of that moment and it being that moment, that, that 30th of a second or whatever. And so I, 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 I think that's how the strength of photography and when photography becomes more manipulated and more worked in, and it's trying to become more like painting or whatever, mm -hmm. that's when it loses its, for me, it's... It's, it's real power. And so, yes, I love 
those powerful images and they've been very important to me that we've all seen and mm. now we maybe don't trust anymore mm. because we don't know if it was real or not. I mean, yeah. could, I, could I make my work now in a time when so many things are manipulated that, that it is important I actually go out there and make these things and I haven't, com I haven't done those on a computer. You know, our, our children now reading photo photographs differently to than they used to. I, I don't know. I suppose because they're doing so much photography on their phones that they know that this is kind of a representation of something happened. So I don't know. Are you tempted to switch into something that's closer, like the phone, as an instrument? The phone as a mm -hmm. thing to photograph? Yeah. Um, um, pr probably not. I mean, I do photograph occasionally with this. I've got nothing else with me uh, but um, you know moments like I mean when Joel my my uh, youngest son when he left primary school the last day we're in the schoolyard you know it's a big moment when they before they move on to the high school and it began to rain and he lay down to do a shadow you know, that was great you know these rain shadows I do when it begins to rain and the idea of your of, a, of someone leaving a shadow in a school where everybody's shadows mm. and memories. Oh, it was great. So all I had was my phone, but it ran out of battery. <laughs> and I didn't get <laughs> it. So, <laughs> no. Yeah. We have a question right here. Um, can you explain more about, like, your, your relationship with, like, tree roots, sort of? Um, like, when you're... I'm not trying to be like aggressive, but like gouging into the earth and like sort of like seeing them. Like, how do you? What is your thought process? Does that make sense? Well, it, um, it's. I try. I'm. I, I. I am as careful as I can be, but I do feel that I live with trees, not just look at them. I live with them. I'm part of them, and I get really. Uh, anxious and upset when the whole uh, protective aura around trees makes it f person feel guilty for st sitting by a tree, standing on the tree, climbing a tree, engaging with the tree. So I do care, but I feel that I am also part of that and part of that landscape and will take great care of the, the work I'm doing now. The w all you see where the line of the, l l the, the work is going. It's all about trying to minimize any impact on the trees that I'm, I'm passing through. Hold on, hold on one second just to get the mic back. If you see, like, when you go to a, like a, a place, you've like, decided to go to this place, and you've, like, you're putting down the, the sort of like, framework, um, does like the way a particular tree grows or like how it's gone, like does that influence the original idea? Or does it like have you ever felt like it's a seed for something else? I, that might I'd, be too abstract. Um, well, no, my relationship with trees is very, you know, I have very deep, long term relationships with particular trees in, near to where I live. And, uh, um, you know, there are trees, there's a particular oak tree at the bottom of my, the field in front of my house. This is a huge oak tree. And it's been dying so, since I've been there. And it's been a, a huge privilege to see this tree dying slowly. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, it got to this, was this one, one little, it almost looked like a small tree growing out of the big tree high up. And I've got a photograph of this kind of little tree, uh, the tree, and then it died. And uh, last year it fell, and it fell. And, you know, I've made so many works on this tree already before it fell. And when it fell, it was really, you know, you c I couldn't describe it as a death because it was it's producing so much life in its death on the ground. And I made a whole series of works when it first fell, where I got up in the dark and just stood in the dark. And as dawn rose, as the sun rose, my shadow is cast onto the tree. 
and then my shadow cast. So I stand for an hour, an hour and a half, absolutely still. They're, f they're filmed, so I, you know, I, you can, they're, they're shown. Well, I've never shown them. Nobody wants to watch them. <laughs> but I've got lots of these things that, uh, you know, it's a single shot. Just set the camera up, and it, it goes for about an hour, an hour and a half as my shadow crosses. It first it merges out of the tree. And I mean, I can't describe in words what, I'm thinking, feeling about with making those works, but they are both in respect, a requiem, and also a, a, a mark of homage and hope mm. for that, that tree. I learned so much from the tree and respond so much to the trees and, and the way that they... I mean, I, the things that I make, Stone by stone, piece by piece, are like, are akin to the way things grow, layer by layer, cell by cell. And I think the process of growth is so important to what I do as an artist. So this, I, I do identify with trees. And the trees are the perfect sculpture, the way they grow into that space and draw that space and articulate that space. Wow. We've got a question over here. Thank you. Um, Andy, you've spoken about the granite you found on the East Coast and also the peculiarities of this campus. And I wanted to ask you about <laughs> the broader landscape here, and that's the park. And it has these extraordinary carriage roads and also sculpted staircases. And I wondered how much they had played into what you're doing here or other works you'll think about going ahead. Well, I haven't really gone far off the campus, to be honest. <laughs> I've been kind of busy. And, uh, but I, 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 and, and I, I, I do like that I have been kind of busy to do that. And then I'm told about these stone staircases. And yeah. I just love that there's a resonance there that I didn't force or even know about, you know? And that often happens. And... Um, to some extent, I think if I'd come here and just seen those for a couple of days and thought, oh, I'll do something like that, it wouldn't have the depth of resonance that something I'm making now is. I mean, this particular work, um, for those who don't know, uh, the, the line will start at the road. Is, I mean, I've actually started at the wrong end. That was the easy bit to begin with. I didn't want to start at the difficult bit because I had enough of what I was, you know, I just didn't know what I was doing already, let alone start digging up the main road and attaching the <laughs> certain line from there. So, but in, if, in effect, the work will be endless in that the curbstone alongside the road here, when it gets to one of the entries, we'll take a left and then we'll just become this sinuous line that will travel through the campus. And I hope that that will resonate with the ideas of coming to this place, taking, coming off the main road and, how, and the passage through this place for the students. And that's why I hope people will walk it. I know they will. They, they will have their own way of walking it. There'll be all different ways of approaching the, the line. And that when they leave here, wherever they are in the States, any city, and they see a curbstone, a road, they'll think of here. And the road is such a powerful form and idea, mm -hmm. isn't it? It is. You know? And this stone that is solid and strong is at the same time so fluid and change, you know, the way that it travels, as it has done in roads and buildings. And so I think it connects with so many things. And now that it has these staircases here and the stoneworks and the whatever, that really roots it in the place. So it talks about here, but also elsewhere too, which is what the college is about too. I don't, I think we have one question that's here. There's a one of those striped. Yes, hi. Hi, thanks so much. I wondered if you could talk about, I don't know very much about the project you're doing here, but the idea of a road in the heart of a college that is devoted to trying to tackle climate change. Just, I, I just wondered if you could talk a bit about the tension there, if there is a tension. In this particular piece, um, well, it's gone off the road and it's done by foot. And it goes from, it travels from the road to the sea. 
So it is back to the land. And it's, but it's also a connection to where things come from. Because how many people even not see these curves, stones, let alone think of being where they come from, what they are, and that we are connected to the land in a very deep and powerful way to everything that is around us. And in terms of your own fears for the environment and the ecology, can you say something about that? Well, it is that really that I feel so bound up with the, with the land and that when I... The, the weather laying in the laying on the ground when it's raining the sun shadows the, we are so bound up with that that we are so part up with it and that's a really important thing to remember that it isn't something that we're just seeing on a in a documentary that it's it's us and we're bound up with that i think is really um, Im, important and how how we deal with that i really struggle with how to sort that out from my own just even the traveling, I now go for much longer trips and here for six weeks. I haven't brought a crew with me. I'm working with local people. But I don't know how long I can sustain that, how long I should sustain that. I really don't know. I mean, we all, you know, how do we deal with that? Is that enough? I don't know. I really don't. Uh, Andy, I think that you've done the thing. Um, that Riley asked us to do at the very beginning. <laughs> See what was right in front of us. Yeah. Yeah. No. Thank you very much. Please join me in thanking Andy Goldsworthy. Told you. <laughs> oh, that's nice. <laughs>Imagine that phone call to Liz at the gallery, like, uh, Liz, Andy's covered himself in seaweed. Um, is this a bad thing? Like, what do I do in this? In the, um, you know, I've loved this guy's work since I was a teenager, and when we were getting this together, you know, however many months ago, and the question came up, okay, so who's going to interview Andy? I was like, me? Me? No, 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 that's not... And then, um, well, who's going to introduce them? I'll do it. I'm going to do it. And I'm so excited that we, we had Courtney here to interview and Riley to introduce. That was absolutely amazing. Thank you. Um, just want to uh, conclude by saying, you know, this morning we talked about metaphorical telescopes and microscopes as a way to understand the world around us. And Andy's quote that said, he said, uh, a way, art is a way in which things are revealed. And I think that's absolutely true. Revealed not just the world around us, but what's inside also. And this work of Andy's Roadline um, has and will continue to reveal the place the artist, and COA as an institution. I have always said, if there's one artist who embodies everything that this college does, it is Andy Goldsworthy. And when asked why, I'm just gonna show them this discussion tonight, because it's absolutely wonderful. So thank you, and join us for drinks up on top of the hill. Thank you.